And welcome to the 2020 Pennsylvania Leadership Conference. We thank Tim DeFore for being with us. We thank Rick Santorum for getting us off this morning. A reminder that all of the components of the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference will be available for viewing on our website, paleadershipconference.org. So if you miss a panel or a speech and you want to, you want to see it or you want to see it again, uh, or send the link around to your friends, it'll all be at paleadershipconference.org. And now we are going to talk about an issue that is very near and dear to many Pennsylvanians and folks across the nation. One of the issues that animates a lot of voters in especially presidential and congressional elections, and that is health care and a free market approach to health care. And here to moderate our panel this morning is Jezri Friend. Jezri is the senior government relations representative for the Manufacturers and Business Association. He is a veteran of the U.S. Army JAG Corps, and most importantly, he went to uh, one of the, if not the finest universities in the Commonwealth, Gannon University in Erie, where he resides with his wife and children. Please welcome Jezri Friend. Thank you, Loman, for that uh, great introduction. And uh, thanks for the shout out to uh, the Gem City up in Erie. If you don't see it, this is the best time of year to go check that out. Um, obviously honored to be here today at the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference and really tie together two topics uh, that personally I'm very excited about. Um, something my organization, the Manufacturer and Business Association, is committed to. Uh, something every policy maker in this country should be aware of and should adopt and I think most Americans are very concerned about. Um, and that's a free market approach to affordable health care. So today we're going to be looking at the perspectives from uh, an academic perspective, a legislative angle, as well as the grassroots activist perspective. And my goal for this morning's discussion is that our panelists and their different perspectives uh, will lead us all to the same conclusion. And that is, uh, and to quote one of my favorite authors and Harvard professor Arthur Brooks, uh, free markets are, in fact, the best tonic for your economic woes. So to kick things off, uh, joining us via Skype is my new friend, uh, a senior research fellow and healthcare scholar at the Mercatus Center at, the, at, George, Washington, or, I'm sorry, at George Mason University, uh, Dr. Gray, uh, Dr. Robert Grayboys. Dr. Grayboys, thank you for joining us. So, uh, Dr. Brayboys, I was wondering if you could uh, kind of kick us off into some of the research you've done recently. You've uh, published a few papers on the higher care, ho costs of health care, and also um, maybe some of your more um, flaunted work in your work with the uh, fortress-like mentality when it comes to the prices of health care and the health care industry. Sure, absolutely. Uh, probably my best known work is something called Fortress and Frontier in American Healthcare, where I sort of set out my research agenda that I've done for the next seven years. Uh, what that work essentially argued was that for the longest time, for decades and decades, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, however you want to put it, have been battling each other mightily, but really haven't been focused on, you know, there have not been actually that severe a difference between the two views. They, uh, uh, they, they tended to uh, want to control things centrally. They had different ways of doing it. The, uh, the uh, people on the left tended to want Washington to really tightly control the way we do health care. People on the right tended to want to do it in the states, but still a lot of it was centralized control. And also that most of the debate was over federal health insurance law. And I'm somewhat, of, <clears throat> when I talk to conservative friends, I'm somewhat of a contrarian. Uh, I tend not to focus so much on federal health insurance law, on uh, the things that they tend to love, and I'm fine with HSAs, HRAs, AHPs. Um, I tend to focus much more on the supply side, which is where I think you can make a real difference. You can actually also reach across the aisle and find some allies. Uh, the amazing thing is that, and I've done quite a bit of writing on this, you can find my writing at mercatus.org, that's M-E-R-C-A-T-U-S dot O-R-G, and just uh, search on my name, search on healthcare, and you'll get all these things coming up. And um, the experience of COVID-19 has been astounding. Uh, during COVID-19, we have seen more innovation in healthcare, the sort of stuff I've been writing about for years. 
more during the last six months than you've had during the last, I don't know, 60 or 70 years. All of a sudden, the states have dropped the CON, Certificate of Need requirements that required you. If you want to, you're a hospital and you want to add new beds, you got to go beg the state and play games with politicians. Scope of practice, if you're a nurse practitioner, you were in many states not allowed to practice up to the level of your training because, well, in many cases, doctors had lobbied their way to prevent you from doing those things. <clears throat> There's a uh, magnificent movement uh, out there in primary care called direct primary care. <clears throat> and a lot of states have put uh, obstacles in its way. But again, during COVID, it's been loosened up. The, I think um, professional licensure and telemedicine, <clears throat> all of a sudden, states are welcoming doctors from out of state uh, mm -hmm. during the height of COVID. Please come into our state, help our patients, help our citizens. We don't care that you're not licensed in our state. If you're licensed in some state, come in and help. And the same with telemedicine. If you are a doctor uh, 3,000 miles away and one of our patients in our state wants to see you, uh, by all means, let them get on the computer and talk. So I, these are incredible changes, and I think these are actually more substantive changes than most of the insurance stuff we talk about. Mm. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, that these things will outlive COVID, that when COVID is gone, and it won't be forgotten, but when, it's, uh, when it fades away, uh, that it will have changed the landscape in that way, and at least something positive will have come out of it. Um, the only other things I'll say before I'll turn it back to you is um, I'm, I have written, I'm quite a bit of a skeptic on some of the, some of the ideas that are quite popular on the right, the, the mandatory price transparency. I've just written a paper on why that can do more harm than good. And uh, the idea that, uh, that if we allow drug imports from Canada and elsewhere, that it's going to lower the prices here. I'm a skeptic on that, and I've written on it. Uh, we won't, won't have time today to go through the why that is, but you can find it on the website. Back to you. <laughs> Thanks, doctor. Uh, and I think the paper, I read that, uh, that's that your recent paper, I think September 24th, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, Curing High Health Care Prices. Um, and I, I saw your kind of conundrum you found yourself in, where it says, here's the solution, but that might not actually be the solution. You, you kind of finish up and summarize the paper saying um, there are some alternative solutions. Maybe just briefly, could you speak to what maybe some of those might be? Right, and actually I just did. So uh, there's the a sentence that, that it, sure, I'll, I'll repeat it and restate it. Um, that, you know, so the sense is a lot of people think we require mandatory tri price transparency, that uh, everyone's going to have to reveal all their prices and their bargaining and what insurers do with hospitals, that that'll somehow lower prices. In fact, in many cases, as I've written, and it's a, a little bit of a convoluted argument, but you can find it there, in many cases it will actually raise prices rather mm. than lower them. Uh, so the answer, uh, if you want to lower prices, a lot of it has to do with not, not revealing prices like that, but rather getting rid of barriers to entry, allowing nurse practitioners to compete on certain services with physicians, allowing direct primary care uh, practices to compete with traditional practices, allowing a telemedicine doctor in Nebraska to compete with a doctor in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, to allow easier licensure if some if a doctor wants to move from uh, New York to Pennsylvania and open up a practice there make it easier to do so it's these lowering of the barriers to entry and and on the federal level things like making it easier to get drugs and devices approved through the Food and Drug Administration but the idea is drop the barriers get the obstacles out of the way and that's that's really uh, uh, I think a, a far more effective way of getting prices down and getting better care for more people at lower cost year after year. Well, thank you, Dr. Grayboys. And you kind of answered my last question I had for you. And, you know, I was going to sure. ask you, what are some of the barriers for policymakers to kind of have real effective meaning uh, reform here? So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, and I'll just say that we do yes. have, uh, we have something that we publish uh, called the Healthcare Openness and Access Project, HOAP, HOPE, and it lists for every single state, uh, oh, I don't know, roughly 40 uh, different obstacles and how the states measure up. So 
That's one thing your legislators can go right to. Well, you heard, you heard it here. Uh, he's got it all taken care of. You just got to go to his website and check it out. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. And we're going to circle back around to all our panelists um, after our comment session. Um, I want to turn our conversation to my now dear friend, um, former small business owner, still small business owner, yeah. still small business owner, uh, a representative in the General Assembly from Moon Township, Representative Valerie Gatos. Thank you for being here this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so in talking with the legislative side, uh, Representative Gatos has a unique kind of creative solution uh, that may be more common than you think. Um, and to kind of tee up my, where my thoughts are going with this is in the business world, health insurance has remained one of the highest costs of doing business for employers. In fact, uh, small employers specifically pay on average 18% more than their uh, large employer counterparts. Um, and we can't ignore the fact that in the first five years of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, 25% of small businesses who are providing uh, health insurance as a benefit were no longer able to do that. That number has since skyrocketed. Um, so now S Representative Gatos actually has a creative solution uh, to help small businesses. Could you tell us a little bit more about what your uh, solution is? Sure. Well, let me, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, I was in business for 25 years prior to running for state office. And I personally experienced that with, with my employees. I had a small company, had a handful of employees, and I had offered health insurance in 2008. I found that uh, they jumped, like you said, 18% the first year. Wow. And, and then the next year, it was another like 16%. And I even went to offering, trying to offer uh, employees an HSA, a yeah. uh, health savings account. Yep. Uh, and, and that was also brought some challenges as well. So I personally experienced this. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking to a lot of folks who are my constituents, they're experiencing it as well. We have a lot of individuals who... Uh, are the small business owners, the individual contractors. Uh, mm -hmm. We have folks that are in the restaurant industry now, yeah. as we're seeing, that they're being affected Unreal. by this. And, and so what, what I came to the legislature saying that, you know, I'm going to do something about health care uh, to make it more affordable. And this is the legislation that I've introduced, which is House Bill 2200. Yes. And it does address um, offering affordable health care to small employers. So on House Bill 2200, could you tell us just a little bit of the details? How does it help small businesses? What's unique about it? Sure. Why them? Well, you know, one of the things about the affordable health care that had occurred was that it had prevented, mm. uh, it, it suddenly prevented uh, yes. small associations or associations from enabling companies to pool together, which yes. this is where we're talking about yes. the free market. Um, if large corporations can have the benefit of scale, mm -hmm. Uh, small businesses should have that opportunity as well. And this is what this bill does. Outstanding. Well, it sounds like a good idea. Um, uh, so how could, um, I say maybe how much, I've heard some different things that maybe um, these AHPs, what you're talking about, association health plans, how, could, how much could they actually save a small business in health insurance premiums? Do you have any numbers on that? I do. In fact, this, this is just astounding. Yeah. The numbers are almost 30%. Wow. And, you know, it's just remarkable, particularly when you look back at a small business like mine that, yeah. that took a hit of 18% a year. Wow. And that's compounding. It's not an 18% all one time. It's, it's every year. <laughs> every year. It's, it's getting a little more, a little yes. more, a little more. And, and what we're seeing is that we're actually seeing a lot of employers uh, stop offering health plans uh, as a result of this, and that's not good for business. Right. You know, we were talking about that uh, health care is one of the top costs. Uh, yeah. Energy and health care are the number, you know, one and two yep. uh, costs for a business, and this is something that we are trying to do to help businesses succeed. Now, you know, as we're talking about in the time of COVID, this has just become even exponentially mm. more important to do, yeah. as we were saying about the, the, the restaurant uh, the, the restaurant industry that was just hit exceptionally hard by that. Yeah, especially in Pennsylvania, more so than I think some other states. In Pennsylvania, it's we're, been we're very lucky. <laughs> well, you know, the statistic is almost 60% of all you know restaurants and businesses you know may go out of business as wow. a result of some of this. So, you know, we're going to be left with a number of individuals who are not going to be able to get health care, and uh, this is pretty problematic for our the, our economy. You know, yeah. getting people back to work and getting them. Uh, the health care that they need is going to be absolutely essential. Well, it seems like an admirable uh, concept, provide more people with health insurance. I think that's the goal of those on the left and the right. It's a mutual thing, more people to be covered by health insurance. 
Um, well, you know, Jezri, yeah. and, and what's, what's phenomenal uh, about this is that, or I should say remarkable, is that there's 30 other states who have, uh, mm. who are doing this, what I'm proposing, uh, and, and, and we're one of the few states that's behind. Wow, 30 other states. So I imagine states. there's some blue states in there, some red states, maybe some it's purple states like Pennsylvania. <laughs> exactly. Wow. I mean, it, it's almost you know, it's it's almost universal that people realize that this is something that has to be done. And right now, Pennsylvania should be doing this. So association health plans isn't a revolutionary idea. No. This is something that other states are going and doing, and we just need to get it going now in PA. Absolutely. Wow. Um, Couple follow-up questions on that is I, I've heard of these association health plans, and to be honest, we've worked with some of them in the past. Um, but some of the pushback is, well, you can't have um, you know all your essential health benefits, or you're gonna you know there are junk plans, or there's room for fraud. Could you speak about that? Is there a way to have you know cost-saving measures in these plans and still provide you know essential coverage? Well, abs absolutely. That, this is what this yeah. this is what this legislation does: wow. is that it enables people to have those essential health benefits um, at a cost that is affordable. Wow. Um, last question for you, real quick, and then we're going to go on to our next expert panelist. Thank you for your time on that. Um, I I saw this and I wanted to bring it up because it's in this sphere. But you recently actually had some success this summer, which being a legislator in Pennsylvania is very difficult to do <laughs> in this political uh, climate. Um, the governor actually signed a bipartisan bill that That's you sponsored, um, which is nothing short of a miracle these days. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Sure. It's, uh, so this is basically the, the Prescription Drug Freedom Act. Okay. And uh, it, what it does is it, it lifts what's called a gag order on pharmacists to enable them to tell you that you can get the best price possible. Mm. In many cases uh, prior to this legislation that... Uh, Pharmacists were in, a con were in contracts with uh, pharmacy benefit managers who supply the medication uh, to them or the pharmacy, and, uh, and they were prohibited from telling you that you can get a cheaper price wow. by paying cash. Now, you know, how alarming is that to right. think that, that your copay could be more expensive uh, than if you were to pay cash? Right. So when, when a lot of pharmacists said, you know, we've got coupons and things like that, that was some of the, the backdoor way to say, hey, look, you know what? We, we can offer you a lower price. So now this is, uh, my bill made it, and this is Act 67 uh, of 2020, and it makes it so that the pharmacist can tell you that you can get a better price on drugs. Well, congratulations on that noble feat. Uh, not easy to do <laughs> with, with, this, uh, with, with this legislature. <laughs> um, we're going to turn our attention now to more of the grassroots perspective. Routing out our, our panel today is uh, Potomac Tea Party leader uh, and founder of the Obamacare True Squad, Christopher Wright, good morning. Good morning, Jezri. Thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> I've been asked to talk about single payer. I come at it from the perspective of an activist who has collected all the bad news about single payer for the last 10 years. I'm going to give you an analytical framework that you can use to evaluate single payer. The framework also applies to Obamacare and Medicaid expansion, and you can use it to evaluate just about any policy proposal coming from the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. I see three patterns in the news about single payer. Number one, the supporters tell a lot of lies. Number two, they won't talk about the problems of their proposals. And number three, they're wrong about everything. Number one, lies. They lie about the cost. Bernie Sanders' single payer health care proposal was studied and his cost estimates were found to be bogus. In California, supporters would not even put a number on the table because they knew that would sink the popularity of their plan. Now. The government health care costs have been studied by policy analysts, and they found that if you include all the costs, that you get quite a different conclusion. So if you include things like building costs, collection of premiums and taxes, accounting, waste, fraud, and abuse, auditing, then this is what the conclusion is. Quote, economists who have tallied the full administrative burden of government health insurance programs conclude that administrative costs are far higher in government programs than in private insurance, and that comes from the Cato Institute. <clears throat> Second lie, the Physicians for a National Health Program, a far-left group, PNHP, ran an article claiming there is no evidence that people come from Canada to America to get any kind of medical services. Poppycock. 
the head of a Canadian province that's like an American governor came to the US for heart surgery in 2010. In 2017, a study was done and it was found that 217,000 Canadians crossed the border for medical services that they got in the United States. <clears throat> so here's my question. Isn't there something wrong if they have to lie to make their case? Number two, they won't talk about the problems. It's all rose-colored glasses with them. You never hear them talk about low reimbursement rates for, from the government for providers and doctors, which is going to create access problems. Doctors simply won't participate. A lot of them won't. They won't talk about the access problems. They won't talk about the rationing, the wait times, the canceled surgeries, the doctor strikes. Now, all of these have been in the news, and people often die while waiting in single care mm. programs, uh, single payer programs like they have in Canada and the UK. Death by waiting, they call it. These are not isolated incidents. I have lots of stories from everywhere in the world about disasters caused by government-run health care all over the world. I'll give you just one story. A Canadian woman died waiting for a bone marrow transplant. She uh, was waiting in an Ontario hospital. She was number 30 in line, and the hospital could only do five of a year uh, in their single-payer program. Well, too bad for her. <clears throat> All we hear about from the supporters, the cheerleaders of single payer, are the imperfections of the current system and how bad it is. Pick, pick, pick. Every little problem. Collect every grain of discontent, just like Lenin said. They won't talk about the problems of their own proposals, how they intend to address them. When they put down the pom-poms and stop cheerleading and start talking about the problems of their own proposals, that's maybe when I'll start to listen. So here's my question. If single payer is so great, why do millions of Brits buy private health insurance to escape the mind-boggling stupidity of the National Health Service? Number three, they're wrong about everything. They keep saying it's simple to finance single payer. Uh, if it's so simple, why did Vermont give up? Vermont gave up on their single payer plan uh, trying to form a proposal when they realized it would drive employer payroll taxes to 25% and drive employers out of the state. The UK NHS is perpetually running out of money. It's a constant refrain. The budget didn't give us enough money. Give us more money for single payer in the UK. <clears throat> they also say that single payer will equalize care. That's not true. In the United Kingdom, the single payer hospitals have started to accept private paying patients. And that, does, that doesn't sound like equality to me. In Cuba, the elite gets okay care, but the facilities available to the average person would curl your hair. You would not even send your dog there. I have the video to prove it. Canada is another example. People who are well off can cross the border to go to the U.S. for medical services. If you're less well off and you can't escape the single payer system in Canada, well, the people who uh, are made to suffer the most in the name of, of equality are the ones who uh, can't escape the, the, the less well off. So here's my question. Why would you trust anybody, any proposal from people who lie through their teeth, won't talk about the bad stuff, and can't accurately perceive reality? This framework applies to Obamacare and Medicaid expansion and beyond. Who could forget the 2013 PolitiFact lie of the year when Obama said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. It was all a lie. They had a memo from HHS that was discovered by and published by NBC. They knew it was a lie, and Obama was out there 19 times saying that same thing. The, they're wrong about everything. Enrollment, average enrollment under Medicaid expansion in the expansion states has been more than double than what they predicted, 110 percent according to the Foundation for Government Accountability. And they won't talk about the problems. And now we're going to go beyond health care just for a tad. Whoever talks about the toxic waste and the disposal problems of dead windmills and dead solar panels and dead batteries or the fact that electric school buses conk out in the wintertime. Whoever talks about that. So to sum up, they lie about everything, they won't talk about the bad stuff, and they're wrong about everything. Now, I have all the bad news about single payer on my personal website, liberato.us, and all the bad news about Obamacare and Medicaid expansion on ObamacareTruthSquad.com. Thank you, Jesuit. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wright. That was very thorough and uh, very uh, informative. I mean, there's a lot of good examples there. Why do you think it is, with all this information out there, and there's so many things to, to kind of really crack down these claims. Why do people keep saying it? 
It's the big lie. The bigger the lie, the easier it is to believe. And the more often you repeat the lie, then the more believable it becomes. And they have control of the big media. They have control of academia. They have control of Hollywood. So they have all the big megaphones. Um, and what the political right needs to do is create bigger megaphones to get our message out there better. Uh, that was my thought. Was what, what can folks do to learn more? But obviously, like you said, get out the truth more and, and use it as a, a platform. Do you think some of this is going to be, is there any hope, I suppose? Is, I, I hear a lot of it from some of the businesses I talk to is maybe single payer is not that bad. I mean, obviously, you went into a lot of the details of it, but what would you say to that business owner that says, well, maybe single payer could just solve our problems um, because of the cost is so high for like, a small business owner? You hear this a lot from employers. Well, if we just fob off all our health care costs to, uh, to, the, uh, to the government, then we can compete better as businesses. Well, what happens when these proposals are made and they, they sound great at the beginning and everybody's rah-rah and the employers are for them. What happens in a place like Vermont as the months go by and the weeks go by and the, the proposals get studied and all the problems then become apparent and the proposals get abandoned because they're completely unworkable in fantasy land, uh, that's, when, that's when people realize, wake up and smell the coffee. Right. And by then it's unfortunately not, not in a good place. Um, we have just a couple more moments, and I want each of our panelists to have one last opportunity with some parting words. Um, Dr. Grayboys, are you still with us? I certainly am. Okay, great. Um, so uh, one minute, uh, lightning round. What should Americans know most about your work, or what's the most important thing when it comes to health care in the free market to you? The most important thing is that the key, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is to enable Healthcare providers and people who aren't yet healthcare providers to innovate. Uh, and the way I like to put it is healthcare needs to be as innovative in the next 30 years as information technology was in the last 30 years. Oh, thank you for that. Um, we're going to go right down the line. Representative Gatos. Sure. Well, you know, we were talking about if, if, if we think that government cares about the number of people who get mm. coverage healthcare. It's not about the number of people who are getting covered because my bill will actually add additional people getting coverage wow. for health care. Um, and, Desiree, I believe you were at the public hearing of the insurance committee when we had discussed this. And, you know, we got a lot of uh, pushback from the insurance department, <laughs> and I couldn't believe they actually said flat out that, well, you know, if we actually allow small businesses to pool in this free market system, then um, who's going to pay for some other, uh, uh, other levels of health care? And we said, well, but this plan will actually add more people on. Yes. And they looked there at us with blank stares because it's not about the number of people getting health care. It's about, for them, it's about, you know, just getting the coverage and getting paid and, and, and making sure that that's, it's on the backs of small business, which we don't want. You know, we want a fair shake. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to represent the folks that uh, want to try to get more health care and also um, have a free market system that will lower the cost for everybody. Well, I, I want to thank you for all your work you're doing in the legislature for beating that drum and keeping to it. And thank I you. think actually know the study you're referring to is in 2019, the Congressional Budget Office did a study on this, and they said actually as AHPs expand across the country, they, says, um, they predict there's over a million country nationwide will actually have health insurance for the very first time. These people yes. have never even had health insurance yes. care before. Um, and so moving on uh, to Mr. Wright, uh, one minute, last words. What should America know about most? Sure. We started to do Obamacare True Squad in 2012. Our vision is you pay your doctor directly for the small stuff, have catastrophic insurance for the big stuff. Prices will fall by half. And when that happens, it will be much easier to help the people who really need the help. Now, um, we, our big thing has been catastrophic insurance over the last eight years, and we are grateful to the Trump administration for effectively bringing it back in the form of short-term plans, which has just uh, this week been reaffirmed in the president's new health care plan. I saw some of that. Yeah, I was catching some of that last night. Well, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Loman Henry and the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, our distinguished guests. You can follow more about them on their websites. Look them up, Google them, follow them. You can check out a little bit more what I do in the Manufacturer and Business Association at www.mbausa.org. Um, and I want to thank you all, lastly, for your attention to this very important issue. Please don't let this uh, issue die. Do more work. Be that soundboard. And continue to dig deeper into these very important issues. Thank you very much.